Thank you. This is a, a very interesting session. I think we have a lot of good uh, uh, presentations again, and I think it is good to keep them as quick as we can. Eight minutes is a good time to get the key points down and then generate that discussion, and we can have a bit of a facilitated discussion afterwards. So again, let's not drown everybody <laughs> out with the presentation, but have that interaction. So first to, uh, to uh, bring up to the floor again, Mario. I think everyone's met him from his first presentation. And this is on reflection on sector's progress in bringing about necessary changes. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, this time I'll try to you stick want to. <laughs> I'll try to stick to the eight minutes. And um, yeah, the title I was given was reflection on, se on sector's progress in bringing about necessary changes. But I think that I'm going to reflect probably on, on the research and development community's progress in bringing about the necessary changes in the livestock sector. So, uh, as I said, probably the first observation, historical observation of, of all the work that we do is that I don't think that we have been responsive enough to the fast changes in the system. And this is something that necessitates that we actually change. I showed these, for example, demands of livestock product trends of the last 20 years. and. Uh, Look at the changes in, in milk, for example. Look at the, the changes in poultry. Uh, these happen basically, uh, it, these are changes in demand. How we're trying to supply that uh, <coughs> through animal numbers, as I said, is something very dangerous. Because at the end of the day, after a lot of years of investment, this is the Ethiopian milk yields of the last 10 years. And <coughs> I mean, I know that there's plenty of donors here, and, and with, with all my respect, uh, uh, with all the investment, we are not moving the, the needles. So what is it really that we're going to need to do here to be able to, 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 to change this? Some of the projection, that's, and I see livestock master plans, that they, rea they look at this reality and then they say, oh well, and then we're going to go like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah? Okay, well, how are we going to develop those transition pathways? I think that we need a little bit more realism in this kind of work. The second, the second observation, I, I think that we sometimes overemphasize the, the lack of data that we have and how it really influences on decision making. We always say, oh, well, look, it's because we don't have data that we cannot do this. And in reality, there's very few uh, processes, especially on investments that actually are fully data driven. I think that we, uh, uh, some, I think it was Alan who mentioned this yesterday that look, the political economy of data use is enormous and I think that we really, really need to start uh, thinking of, of ways of recognizing this and engaging at the right level so that uh, if we're going to use data, it will actually uh, will lead to some uh, some some real uh, real benefits. We see, for example, a lot of <coughs> oops. Oh, I'm giving away all my presentation. Uh, <coughs> so, for example, this issue of, of path dependencies. We did just a, a very discreet project for the foundation, looking at how how decisions are made at different levels. And the big decisions on budget allocations <coughs> are not made with any information whatsoever. These are, these are totally uh, political. These are all done at, at, at the higher level by the finance ministers. So it's really until we start really tri trickling down that, that things uh, start making the use of information. And then <coughs> this is actually a, a graph that if, if you work on information knowledge, you will actually recognize because they use it a lot. So if we want really use of evidence-based methods, uh, they, you really start using data when you really have a very high capacity of uh, understanding the information and using it, and when the data is relatively of low controversy. And that's one of the reasons, well, for example, <coughs> things like numbers of animals and things like that. That's relatively less controversial. But that's why sometimes we get into very heated debates 
about the environmental issues in this space and why there is so much uh, speculation and random numbers and things like that. So I think it's really important to recognize uh, those different things. Uh, then, <coughs> then, okay, then I think that we re also need to probably pay a little bit more atten attention to, to doing actors map, maps before in, in, data, in data projects. Because understanding who uses what and for, for what and who shares different kinds of information then becomes extremely important. At the end of the day, uh, through conversations with African Union officials, we came up with, with this kind of, of a diagram. And sorry about the colors, they're not, very, they're not very good. But at the end, it's finance ministry and the planning ministry are the ones that dictate how much money will be uh, given uh, to the agriculture ministry. And the agriculture ministry, when they uh, give their budget, it's not that they start with a clean slate, as we sometimes believe, that, oh, we can target these investments enormously. No, they start with understanding the costs. I have so many staff that need to be fed on a daily basis. I have so many cars. I'm going to need so much petrol. I have so many buildings. And at the end, what's left is this amount of money just for basic strategic uh, research. So the reality is that the budget allocations I have enormous path dependencies simply of, because of the structure of, 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 of the sectors. And this is, this is what makes uh, it super difficult to change uh, what we want to do in agriculture to make, to make the necessary progress. Uh, <clears throat> so at the end of the day, what we end up with this is, yeah, we end up with a circular conundrum where uh, this political decision making that we really want to influence through better evidence, uh, we cannot do it because we then say, well, look, we cannot think of the return on investments to the, to, to, to the investments that we're making because the data doesn't exist and then nobody uses it and the circle gets perpetrated. So how are we going to break this? I think it's really essential for all of us working in, in, the, data, in the data projects. The other thing that I see and, and that I've seen over the years is that we sometimes don't align with what's happening in other dimensions of, uh, of the policy space. And notably recently, many uh, investments in, in the livestock sector are not aligned with the envir environmental commitments of the countries and a sustainability agenda. For example, we developed, a, well, not we, the royal, you know, livestock master plans were developed for Ethiopia without taking into account Ethiopia's commitments to the Paris Agreement. So there's two sides of government committing to different things, and they're not talking to each other, and we really need to resolve this. Because, for example, Ethiopia committed to a reduction of at least 64% uh, on limiting emissions. Uh, to, to, this was to the level of 2005. This is an enormous reduction, and if we have to implement this for the livestock sector, this adds uh, uh, extra levels of, of emissions intensity that we need to improve and productivity increases that will need to happen if livestock will be part of, of these kinds of agreements. <coughs> the last one, we need to be positive. Yeah, this is, we need to be positive. I think that disruptive innovation is uh, the next frontier of alternatives and we need to embrace them. Uh, we did, uh, recently a, a big inventory of what's coming up in the next 10 years and this was ranked by a range of experts on the basis of uh, the potential to really disrupt and on the potential to to adopt and uh, and be ready and look these are some of the some of the ones up, up here just to give you an idea circular economy all the plant-based substitutes artificial meat feed uh, replacement sources we need to start thinking what are going to be the impacts that this uh, technologies could have on uh, how we see the livestock sector in the future. Thank you. Thank you.
very much. Again, thank you, Mario, for some really interesting food for thought. So I'd like to uh, bring up the, uh, the next presentation uh, by Tim, Tim Byrne. Uh, so scaling up, how do we bring about meaningful change in this sector? Just before Tim speaks, um, I'll just step in and say that uh, we have an opportunity after this session on uh, future-proofing the livestock sector for some donor reflections. So donors, you should have had an email about that just to remind you uh, as you're listening to think about some reflections from the donor's perspective on whether we're kind of meeting the challenges, what the challenges are and whether we're meeting those challenges. We won't put you under any pressure, but there will be an opportunity if you want afterwards for Andrew, Belinda, George to say a few words. Afternoon, everybody. Uh, so as Mike mentioned, this is about um, scaling up and bringing about meaningful change. What I've got here is probably a case study to demonstrate whether the goals that have been set and the interventions that have been made are actually going to move us towards those targets. So this is a project that Abacus Bio did with SEBI, um, and it focused on assessing the impact of interventions to reduce livestock mortality. So in the room, you, you'll, you'll all know that there's a target set um, for SEBI to reduce livestock mortality at the national level by between 10 to 15 per cent. I'm just going to focus on Ethiopia and Nigeria in this, um, in this case. And they're going to achieve that reduction in mortality using interventions, uh, young stock mortality reduction workshops, so training, mastitis vaccines, and best practice reduction, uh, mastitis reduction workshops. So these are, this is the focus of the interventions, and um, we've worked with SEBI to build a, a framework where other interventions can be put in in the future. So how do we go about it? So the first step is to establish some baseline level of mortality in a range of production systems for cattle and small ruminants in uh, Ethiopia and Nigeria. Once we've established that um, baseline mortality, we then build a framework to m uh, map mortality causes to periods of life. That gave us the situation of, okay, where are, where's mortality occurring and why? We then said, okay, we've got these interventions. There's three of them. Where will they have their impact at the farm level in terms of reducing mortality and in terms of reducing mortality equivalents? And I'll explain what I mean by mortality equivalents shortly. And then finally, we accumulate the farm level impacts up to a national level and look over 10 years and say, okay, using these interventions, can we get towards 10 to 15% reduction in mortality? So step one, establish baseline mortality. So using um, a survey of industry experts, and some of those experts are in this room, as well as literature, we mapped for those countries and species, we mapped uh, mortality to different stages of the animal's life. We then, in step two, assign causes of mortality, mortality to those periods of the animal's life. So you can see here a, a bunch of reasons uh, for mortality and a percentage mortality caused by each of these across the, uh, across the animal's life. So this is an example only, but it's obvious, you know, you accumulate across this time frame for these disease causes and we, we get the average baseline mortality. We then say, okay, let's now implement the interventions. So this is just an example and it's using colostrum feeding at birth, which was one of the components of the young stock mortality intervention program. And using expert opinion, we say, okay, well, Colostrum, it obviously manifests in this early stage of an animal's life and it um, enables a reduction in malnutrition and weakness at birth and that reduces mortality because of those causes and so we get this reduction in baseline mortality in this case from 50% to 40%, 45% but this is just an example. So that gives us an understanding of what the baseline mortality was what our range of interventions will do in terms of reducing mortality at different stages. And then we built in what I've called here impact accumulation. So uh, we have um, two of the interventions are actually training workshops. So in consultation with, um, with experts, we, we built in a framework to actually uh, capture ongoing increasing 
but diminishing improvements in farm practice. So after the intervention has taken place, farmers implement that. They, they implement their learnings from the young stock mortality reduction workshops, and they get better and better at, at, at implementing that. And so we assume that over a five-year period after the actual training, they are able to get further gains from, those, uh, from, from the training workshops. But not all of the interventions that SEBI are conducting are focused on directly on mortality. So there's a mastitis vaccine. There's also mastitis, uh, best practice mastitis reduction training. Uh, so mastitis, as uh, many of you will know in this room, uh, has an impact in terms of milk production. So the question becomes for these interventions was don't directly reduce mortality. How do we compare the impact of those production focused interventions versus mortality focused interventions? And we do that with what I've called here mortality equivalents. So just bearing in mind that these are for interventions that prevent a production loss. So imagine mastitis, best practice mastitis reduction training reduces mastitis, mastitis incidence by some amount. We've got all the information in there to establish what that amount might be. And we can ascertain from that reduction in mastitis that you actually get $4 more from the milk yield over the lifetime of the animal because of those improved practices. So the question is, well, what's that $4 worth in mortality terms? Knowing the average animal lifetime profit gives us a baseline from which to deviate that productivity increase. So if an, an animal produces an average profit over its lifetime of $100, we've generated $4 of improvement in production, then a very simple calculation says that, okay, this $4 is actually equivalent to about 4% of what you would generate if the animal was alive, right? So it's that simple. So we built this into the model for those interventions where the impact of the intervention wasn't strictly mortality, but it was to do with production impact. And you can do this for increase in meat output or other interventions that yield productivity gains. So now we have our baseline. We've worked out what the intervention impacts are. We've scaled them up over time where relevant for the training workshops, and we've captured mortality equivalents. Now we want to bring that to a national scale. So under a number of scenarios, realistic, optimistic, and necessary, we've mapped out the sort of effort that would be required and what it would yield in terms of reduction in mortality. So just quickly on this side, I've got an example of the intervention impact for cattle in Ethiopia in a pastoral system. So this is one of those categories uh, inside the um, farm system and country structure. And you can see that with 900 interventions a year, so this is, it it's basically means that 900 farmers have been to a workshop and implemented best practice workshop for young stock mortality. It means 900 farmers have learned the mastitis reduction and 900 farmers have put vaccines in for, into their animals for mastitis. And you can see that at that level, you actually don't make much progress at a national level. If we scale up to an optimistic level where you have 9,000 interventions per year, and assume that the impact of those is 50% greater. So farmers are 50% more likely to generate the improvements. Then we get probably, this is about 5%. So halfway towards our 10% reduction. Just in this Ethiopian pastoral system, to get a 10% reduction in mortality, you have to actually touch with the whole package of interventions, so vaccines and the two levels of training workshop, about 17,000 farmers. So uh, I'm pretty sure the people in this room will realise the, the magnitude of that. That's a big job. So just digging now into uh, the effort required for young stock mortality reduction. So I've got the range of production systems here in countries. If we look at where we're getting to, so remember the 10% target. So within these countries uh, and production systems, just for, life st for young stock mortality training, at a rate of 900 interventions a year, which is the current rate that SEBI is going for, we're only making you know, single digit progress towards that 10% goal at a national level. There's an exception here of Nigeria, and I'll tell you why that is the case soon. At 9,000, we're making, depending on country and system, somewhere between 10 and 45% of the way towards our 10% target. So we're getting, in a good case, about halfway there 
The reason why we're making much more progress in Nigerian cattle is because the herds are bigger. So work, young stock mortality workshops, once you get to a herd, you have a much bigger impact. So you need fewer interventions to actually get towards 10%. And finally, a necessary intervention. So if you want to achieve a 10% reduction in mortality through the young stock mortality reduction training programs, you need to be touching in these countries somewhere between, you know, 1,000 in the best case, but up to 70,000 farmers have to be implementing young stock mortality reduction practices as a result of training. That's a massive job. So what can we conclude from this? Um, it's pretty clear that uh, the interventions have variable effectiveness on farms. So I've mentioned throughout that young stock mortality and mastitis workshops have the potential to have a massive impact at the farm level. But the scalability is challenging just simply because of the sheer number of farmers that have to be touched with tho those training workshops. Vaccines are obviously much more scalable, but they have to be very efficient to actually deliver the mortality reduction benefits or indeed the mortality equivalent reduction benefits. So I think it's worth mentioning that, you know, this 10% is a pretty big, a pretty big target. So, um, and this is maybe a very obvious statement, but, you know, scalable and efficient interventions are where you can have the biggest impact. The challenge looks even bigger if you remove the assumption that farmers improve their performance after they've been trained. So uh, happy to answer any questions. It's probably worth a discussion at some point about, you know, about realistic target setting and, and helping SEBI, you know, move closer towards those targets with the interventions they've got at hand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on. And uh, now we have my uh, colleague, uh, Sirak Bata. Uh, and he's going to be talking on the Livestock Master Plan's challenges and opportunities. And we heard a bit about that from Mario as well, some of the Livestock Plans. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, I will make my presentation very brief on, uh, I will talk more on the challenges and the opportunities in uh, Livestock Master Plan target setting. And of course, just uh, on the process. So as an introduction, uh, Livestock Master Plan is a sector level, uh, national sector level analysis, and it seeks to provide policymakers with uh, <coughs> quantitative evidence on uh, the current contributions of livestock and long-term uh, or long-run potential of the livestock sector. And it helps to identify or to prioritize uh, livestock commodities and value chains. It also tells us how more or much investment uh, in livestock sector can further uh, modernize the sector and improve the lives within the sector. Th the whole process is uh, we do it with uh, local experts, so there is a lot of capacity building also in quantitative planning. So we did <coughs> livestock master plan in Ethiopia, Tanzania, and the Bihar State of India with support of the Gates Foundation, and then in Rwanda with FAO, and then we did also the first phase of livestock master plan in Uzbekistan with support from the, the World Bank. So the LMP process, it has three stages, and then the, the first stage is just to uh, set the, the baseline. We call it the livestock sector uh, analysis. Here we deal more on the past and current trends, just and also we uh, set the baseline. Then we have the long-term or 15 years foresight analysis. Uh, we call it livestock sector strategy, and then out of this livestock sector strategy, we develop five-year value chain specific uh, roadmaps. And then throughout the, the process, there is a lot of co <coughs> consultation with stakeholders. This is an example, for example, in, in Bihar, in India. We always set a group of experts and also uh, steering committees of uh, uh, division heads, so we regularly update them on the process. So for LMPs, we use a tool called LSIPT, Livestock Sector Investment and Policy uh, Toolkit. This is uh, developed um, by AU Aiba with support from FAO, CIRAD, and ILRI, and World Bank. So initially it was uh, 
uh, aligned with the uh, this poverty uh, uh, reduction strategy uh, paper that uh, IMF and World Bank were using to they just see if the livestock sector has the potential to reduce poverty and then if yes if no then that's it if yes then you go to this it has six modules and then the first module is I mean the second module is just to set a coalition of change you set your uh, experts and then also the production zones you identify production zones your data then you start doing micro level analysis then this micro level analysis also feeds the, the macro level uh, analysis here you are you do it by uh, species and also by agroecological zones it <coughs> you you do an analysis for 15 years with business as usual and also you do some intervention and then how does uh, the uh, livestock sector look like in the future when you do some investment and here it's more of uh, the demand supply gap and then how does it going how how is the uh, livestock production going to look like in the future and also the demand and supply gap then you have the the five year uh, five year very detailed uh, roadmap this is how we were doing but in the future we want also to uh, include some other uh, development objectives like gender or food security and others so the process will be more or less the same except that we were doing some monitors, uh, monitoring and evaluation on training, but we were not that much on like post LMP support, for example. We've developed the LMP for many countries, but it's just it. We even try to help them to do some, uh, I mean, to help them to implement LMPs. So some of the challenges that we had was with the tool, that the, 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 the data that's currently used in, uh, it, it, it was used in an ad hoc manner and uh, with a very strong assumption, uh, like fixed price and so on. And then uh, it was not possible also to see how the investment will also change the, the value chains and what, what, what will look the value chains also. There's a value chain module, but it's not linked to the whole process of the, the uh, modeling. Now we had also problem with gender and environment considerations. For example, in Bihar, they asked us to see what will be the impact of the livestock investment in, in, in gender, particularly in value chains like goats and pigs, but we couldn't answer that, the, the tool doesn't allow. We tried to, to work in the outside of the tool, but uh, it, it was not that much, uh, like we can't really link it to the investment, so this was the, our challenge. And when we, Set the scenarios also. Yeah, this she making it to uh, invest in livestock. You you need to have uh, objective and uh, development goals. You also uh, indicators like uh, growth, economic growth, or environment or food security. So the the challenge here is, for example, here if you want to intervene in poverty reduction and then you invest more on chicken village. You can, uh, of course, reduce poverty and food security, and you will have less greenhouse gas emission. But in terms of economic growth, it, it, it doesn't give much. So uh, then if you move to other kind of intervention, like, for example, dairy or broiler, so you can have more economic growth, but then you have also some other impacts like environment. So the, the question is, how do you make a trade-off on this? Uh, and then which decision rule do you use here, and then decision criteria, what type of data or tool. Uh, so this was the, the main challenge that we have, and then we are working on this. So the, the, the opportunities that we hear is there is increased uh, need and interest in livestock master plan. We s this year only that we have scheduled to do livestock master plan in West Africa, in Gambia, and Guinea with the Islamic Development Bank, and then in Odisha State uh, with uh, Gates Foundation and Nepal with World Bank. Uh, so there is a increased need and interest in livestock master plan. And then it's, we formed also a consortium now we are together with FAO and uh, CIRAD. So future LMPs will uh, benefit from the expertise in these institutions. Uh, and then recently also we've got a project called Policies in, uh, at ILRI from Gates Foundation. So this is to help us to improve our tools and then uh, also to, to do some post-LMP engagement uh, on uh, 
using scorecards and so on. Uh, we are working closely also with IFPRI to, to link uh, our policy process with the, the NIPE, the National Agriculture and Investment Policy and the, of the CARIB, just to, to link with them with our matrices to the approach. Uh, we have also some other projects uh, at ILRI, funded by BMGF, the one GLAD that's uh, led by uh, Mikhail and also on gender. We are working close, closely with them to uh, align our work. So this is the uh, approach that we are going to, to use in developing our tools. Uh, we will have the, the baseline, which is more of the LSIPT, the tool that we have been using. But then we will move from LSIPT to when we do forecasting or foresight analysis to more standard uh, multi-market models here. And to answer some of the, the, the shortcoming of the previous methodology, like how does the uh, value chain will look like due to investment. So we, we have a tool at ILRI that we call system dynamics, so we're going to use it to do more of value chain level or meso level uh, analysis. And also this tool will also help us to do some ex anti impact assessment, like uh, to answer some specific uh, questions. So uh, briefly, that's it. Thank you very much. I hope I'm in time. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Sirak. Okay, so I think the final presentation we have is by uh, Tim Robinson from FAO on the tools for future livestock planning. Yeah. Hi. The, um, so I'm going, going to talk about a sustainability a sort of analytical framework that we, we developed in the context of the Global Forum for Food and Agriculture. This is a way of thinking about how, how future developments in, uh, in the livestock sector uh, are in relation to how sustainable they are. And I'm going to focus then mostly on, um, on aspects of... Um, does the light work? Oh, sorry. Oh, well. Uh, anyway, on the, the climate change. Uh, and natural resource use. So uh, yet yesterday we had two two nice sessions from from Mario and Lorenzo, talking about uh, talking about future trends and projections in in the livestock sector. And just to recap, we have population growth, GDP growth, urbanisation, globalisation. These are the these external drivers that impact on the global livestock sector, and that's a growing demand for livestock uh, products by and large. And this um, in different sectors is causing different types of transformation and we have intensification we have structural changes in the livestock sector and we have increased movements of inputs and food and outputs and live animals and and all of these come together to give give concerns over over sustainability and there are opportunities and and risks in in these four dimensions we we reduce the um, the global uh, agenda for sustainable development <laughs> into these four domains that are particular per, per, particularly pertinent to the livestock sector, and that's food and nutrition security, livelihoods and economic growth, animal health and animal welfare, and that includes human health as it pertains to animal health, and climate and natural resource use. So the general trends have impacts on these things, and interventions that we may have on the livestock sector can impact these. And, and an important thing is to try and optimize the synergistic impacts that are, that are positive across these different domains of sustainability and to avoid um, un unwanted negative impacts, so to avoid or manage trade-offs that might occur. So, for example, intensification of poultry production may, may lead to increased concerns for animal health and welfare because of emerging diseases, increased reliance on antibiotics, animal welfare concerns. Those are the sorts of trade-offs that we're talking about that need to be managed, okay? Uh, and this, this framework was developed for the Global Forum for, uh, for Food and Agriculture um, in January 2018, and we've, we've been sort of using this as, a, as an analytical framework, not in a quantitative sense, but, but in, a conceptual, in a conceptual way. So looking at, the, looking at the environmental impacts of livestock, this is, this is a useful starting point. 
And this is looking at the fate of nitrogen that's fed to farmed animals. Okay? Now, this, this pie on the left-hand side shows, shows the sources of food and feed for farmed animals. And we get 120 millions of tonnes of nitrogen uh, going into the system, fed to live animals. And this goes into all of these billions of, of, um, of animals. That, that's the standing stock at any one time. And the interesting thing is that only 10% of all of that ends up uh, in food that we're utilising. So another, about half of all of that is lost through, through non-food products, so skins and hides and, and just general wastage in, uh, in bones and so on. And the vast, vast majority of it, of course, comes out as manure. And some of that is recycled into the system, but a vast, the vast, vast majority of that is, is lost, and that causes pollution and greenhouse gas emissions and all sorts of things. So that's, that's, that's the sort of framework of inefficiency within we, which we, we can look at the global livestock sector. Okay? And, of course, it's, it's a bit careless to, to lump the whole livestock sector together because these impacts are very different for different species, for different production systems and so on. But overall, that's, that's the sector that we're looking at. And this, this gives rise to all sorts of environmental impacts. Nitrogen loss and efficiency is one thing. And, um, and, and greenhouse gases is related to that and is another thing. And the other thing to look at here is that we have this vast area here of, of grass and leaves that's fed to livestock. And of course, that most, mostly uh, talking about ruminant livestock. And it's often said that this is, this, is, you know, this is stuff that can't be used by humans and so on. And that's great. And it, a, lot, lot of, a lot of the stuff that's fed to livestock is unusable by humans, but it comes at a great cost, and that is vast quantities of methane that are produced. Okay? So this brings us on to, to GLEAM, which is our Global Livestock Environmental Assessment Model. And very briefly, we have at the baseline, Marius was talking about these, the livestock distributions, our, our input, our baseline data. We have then production systems, and linked to those, we have herd and flock models for the different types. Uh, those have energetic requirements, and we have, we have feed rations, and we work out what feed intake is, is taken. These have emissions associated with them. The animals have emissions associated with them. The animals produce manure, which has associ em emissions associated with them. Uh, Post-farm processing has emissions associated with it. Uh, all of this comes together into the overall emissions that we allocate into different things. We can look at these emissions in different ways. We can aggregate them to total emissions. We can look at emission intensities. So that's emissions per unit of product. We can look at where they come from. We can map these results. And we can also then start to think about ways in which we can mitigate these emissions. Very quickly going through some graphic outputs. Uh, these are the total emissions. So the beef sector is, is, is clearly the biggest emitter. Buffalo meat is, is, is very small because there's very, very little of it, for example. So you can see how the different species are in terms of their total emissions. But this is an interesting contrast to that, and this is the emissions intensity. And, um, and so beef is, is, is a very high emitting product. Uh, buffalo meat is terrible, but of course there's very little of it, so it doesn't matter quite so much. Poultry, uh, uh, meat and eggs are, are very low per kilogram of protein. So this, this is another way of looking at those emissions, and, and the two really have to be taken, to, taken together. We can also look at the different gases that are produced and the different systems and the measures. And the main three gases are carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And these have very different warming potentials and very different persistences in the atmosphere. So it's important to think about the specifics of the emissions. It's, it's, it's one thing to talk about the emissions. So over a 20-year period, methane has a very, very high warming potential, but, it, but it's, uh, it's absorbed. It has a relatively short lifetime in the atmosphere. So over 100 years, it's become much less important. And then over 100 years, the difference between ruminants and monogastrics is, is therefore much less. So there's, it's important to think about things in the specificity of, of, of these different, um, the different gases and what the implications are. And some might argue that methane, since it's, since it's decomposed in the atmosphere relatively quickly, it doesn't matter because it's just part of a cycle. But uh, as well, you can think that just because it's, it, it is broken down quickly, it's an opportunity for rapid impact and, and to make a big difference quickly. 
targeting methane. And then we can also look at the sources, again, by gases and by different systems. And you, if you look, the, the, the general pattern is much more methane coming out of ruminant systems, and that's replaced by carbon dioxide as we move over to monogastric systems, much more persistent, shorter lived. And so it's very important to think about, about the different gases, the different sources, and then where, where interventions can be had and how they can be most sustainable and, uh, and, and most effective. Uh, and we can also produce map, maps of emissions. And this is, on the left-hand side, we have the total emissions. And on the right-hand side, we have the emissions intensities. Now, obviously, places where we have high total emissions and high intensities as well, <coughs> we really want to target those. In many areas, much of Africa, for example, the overall emissions are very low, but the intensity of emissions is high because of the inefficiency of production. So this is a useful way of looking at things as well. As a slight aside, just to think about error propagation and, and how these inaccuracies that are in the system, at the, at the baseline we have the livestock numbers, okay? And obviously a sort of 10% error in the number of beef animals is more or less a 10% error in the, in the amount of emissions. Whereas when you're talking about then the difference between whether they're in feedlots or grass-fed, the, the errors are going, th that error is going to be less important. Then you can think about all of the precision with which we estimate the emissions from different systems. So really, there's, you know, there's different ways at which these errors come into play, in inaccuracies, and that needs to be taken into account. Recently, for the COP25, we produced this little brochure here, which there's copies of over there, and that, that, has, co that has examples of all of these graphics and so on that you can look at. <coughs> because it's not as if there's nothing we can do about these emissions. There, there are lots of things we can do, and we've sum summarized these in five practical actions. The first is about boosting efficiency, and that's about through, through breeding and health and feeding and management, how we can get more, more product for the amount of emissions we're producing. The second is about recycling and, and the circular bioeconomy, and that, that's come up as well, using that manure to uh, get it back into the system, not wasting those nutrients. And the third is about offsets, carbon offsets. So this is about turning manure into biogas, using livestock facilities to, uh, to generate electricity, for example. The fourth is about protein alternatives, and, and Mario's mentioned that, and there's alternative protein sources for the animals, and also alternative protein sources for people, whether that's plant-based diets or eating insects or whatever. And then there's a whole raft of policy and institutional inter interventions that can be made to, to, to pull down livestock emissions. So summarizing, tackling livestock emissions requires the systems approach. We need to account for the diversity of livestock systems. We need to appreciate the diverse roles that livestock play. Source of emissions vary greatly for different systems and the different greenhouse gases, and that all needs to be taken into account. And, and so the mitigation approaches need to be tailored carefully for the different types of systems that we're talking about and the different environments. And we need to enhance these synergies here in terms of other development objectives, uh, in terms of productivity, adaptation to climate change, uh, enhancing resilience. And we also need to manage trade-offs with other sustainability objectives. So if we're going about reducing emissions, we also don't want to be causing problems in terms of threatening food security and nutrition security, problems for livelihoods and economic growth, introducing animal health issues, and, and also we don't want to impact other areas of, of environmental sustainability. Okay, excellent. Uh, Alan, do you want to do the donor kind of uh, reflection now, or we'll should we get everyone to reflect? I, I think we'll do a bit of uh, reflecting first and then we'll ask the donors to okay. just report after coffee um, is that okay yeah so um vanessa has the solution yeah okay so we've that's been um a useful session different ways of looking at the future the future of livestock um from tim thinking about emissions and where they come from and what we can do about it um tim talking about how we can measure whether we're making any progress towards our targets. Um, Mario talking about the futures of livestock from a kind of global perspective. 
and then uh, CRAC talking about the livestock master plans and how we set targets to kind of achieve the changes we want to achieve. So I suggest we use the kind of one, two, four format again to harvest questions that we did this morning. That seemed to work well. We, we have an innovation. Yeah, we're, we're uh, mixing things up. Yeah. So um, as before, you'll reflect uh, individually for a minute, um, but we're going to shake things up because people are getting very comfortable in their little groups and after lunch, a little bit sleepy. So what we're going to do is after that minute, when you hear the chicken, you got to stand up, get into a group of four. So you want to be with three other people you haven't talked to very much so far in the last two days. So new people. and we. We know who these groups are, so we're going to make sure you're in groups of fresh people who we want new ideas mixing up, and then you're going to jump directly into that group of four and discuss for about five minutes some of your ideas, and then we'll hear from the groups. Sound good? Okay, so one minute for individual reflection, and then be prepared to stand up and uh, find a new group of four, okay? So, go. All right, everyone, groups, thank you so much. Um, so we're going to call on some groups now uh, to hear their insights and thoughts. So I'll start with the group on the far side over here. Hello. All right, so we're going to hear uh, your brilliant thoughts on future-proofing the livestock sector. What do we need to be doing? What, what, has the, what have the presentation stimulated for you? Hello. I hope nobody's agreeing like we were with the presenters. But we had some a little bit consensus that uh, as we focus on greenhouse emissions from livestock, we should also consider the level of greenhouse emissions from humans <laughs> with the changing dietary standards. But as we think about that, humans are very selfish about what happens with them, but it's important. As we take burgers and we leave the natural food, I think we produce a lot of carbon dioxide. So in terms of looking at greenhouse emissions in livestock, we have an opportunity to reduce the amount of greenhouse that the livestock produce just by changing the environment in the rumen and in the gut so that we improve the efficiency of converting the feed so that bulk of the feed remains to be utilized in the body and we end up feeding less to the animals and then we'll be protecting the environment so that uh, people are so alarmed about greenhouse emissions but we still need to eat. If you talk about the, ve the vegan debate, as much as you go vegan, we'll also have to look for a lot of supplements. And even if you look at the artificial meat, I don't know what it is called meat, what is used to make it? How, what's the impact in terms of global warming and the like? So those were a bit of the, the thoughts, but the team was very divergent. So <laughs> Yeah, so we also talked a little bit about um, data and monitoring and, and evaluation, but the importance of having I guess integrity of that data. So Stuart had a really good example of reducing greenhouse gas emissions or emissions from cars. And there was a target set and Volkswagen went and tweaked their software so that they could meet the target. So just being aware of ways that people might game the system. Thank you very much group. Okay, moving on to the next group. Who would like to speak on behalf? What was the most interesting or controversial idea that came out? No, I think it was in the line of the same, uh, like uh, the previous group, uh, the way of thinking. Uh, some of the things that we were talking about is about the fact that we are penalizing the victims uh, in the developed world actually about the impact of uh, climate change by holding them responsible uh, for the outcome, for the results, rather than thinking that they are also need to be uh, kind of part of the uh, adaptation uh, agenda. So this is one of the things that we have been discussing. Uh, we have also been uh, talking about the increased uh, productivity or the efficiency of production. So this can uh, follow different paths, different uh, routes. One will be increasing the number of cows and the other thing will be increasing the productivity or the yield per cow. So we try to, to talk about different countries probably. Uh, what else did we talk about? 
Yeah. So yeah, so it was basically in this. Uh, Thank you very much. All right, uh, was this a group? Okay, uh, would you like to speak? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, the topic was the same, a mission, and uh, we, we just uh, changed some, some theories that uh, it's, uh, it's very good to identify the, uh, the causes and the, the, the ways how to decrease our, our the, the emission. <coughs> But on the other side, what we think that uh, we should see the livestock uh, with uh, his environment, how many trees are around the livestock. He, in Germany, we have a lot of farms, even from the government directives, that if you have a milk farm or a, a, a cattle farm, for one cattle, do you have to have two trees to not decrease the emission, but compensate the emission that the livestock is generating. So when we are looking at that map, which we, I think it's a very good map, on the other side, we should look at the environment, which is the real uh, impact of that, uh, uh, let's say, red uh, uh, um, places of, of the emission, the higher emission, because in, in Latin America or in some uh, African countries, maybe the, the emission of the livestock is high, but the environment is compensating the what they are doing. So it's a global complex issue. Thank you. Okay, so quite a lot of common themes coming out in the discussions. Uh, who shall I turn to next? There's a group in the far corner here. Oh, okay, let's come to you first. Is it Tim? Uh, so we talked um, quite broadly. We first talked about the need for quantification and justification in target setting. Uh, particularly in the context of adoption and scalability. So in small ruminant systems, you know, just the practicalities of getting adoption and, and scaling things up make it very difficult to set targets. Um, well, you can't set realistic targets without considering those two things. Uh, just reflecting on the presentations, um, we also talked about target setting under kind of a quadruple bottom line scenario. So it's pretty hard being a farmer when you're supposed to be really productive and you're also supposed to have optimal animal health and you're also supposed to have reduced greenhouse gas emissions. So I wonder if it's worth thinking about target setting, putting all of those things together somehow. It would be a massive job, but like farmers have to operate profitably, environmentally friendly, you know, animal health and welfare, et cetera, et cetera. So creating a framework which brings all that together somehow and sets targets for each of them because they're not independent of each other. And my colleague here had something to say. I think I've said it. The, the only thing is that um, how do we <coughs> take the realistic adoption rate when, when we say that there is intervention in technology? Can we just assume that 100% adoption or how do, how do we get the realistic adoption rate? Yeah. So this is something that... Uh, they have done in their model, but uh, my question is, you can't just take 100% adoption and then do impact assessment, so this is, I don't know, something to, that we need to say. Yeah. That's a great point. So the sc scaling has to happen in the real world, so we can't assume 100% adoption. There's lots of forces at work, so we need to really think through strategies in that sense. Uh, this group, who would like to speak? <laughs> and any time Vanessa came near, they kept walking sidling away like this. So, <laughs> um, so we had um, a diverse discussion, and it sort of reflects some of the things other people have said. That um, you know, Af I suppose Africa didn't create all the problems, um, so you know it's a bit um, difficult for them to take up all the the climate change kind of initiatives. Um, one thing that, uh, well, we talked about was chickens don't have as big a footprint as, <laughs> yeah, guess who, guess who made that statement, <laughs> as, as the likes of beef. Um, but a, another comment was made that we need to sort of work towards improving local breeds to increase productivity rather than importing from abroad. 
Um, and then the, the issue of behavioral change came up where um, you know, we need to really understand how you encourage that behavioral change so people do um, t take up the, the, the local breeds or whatever, or sorry, the improved breeds and bring about productivity gains. Great, uh, you were in this group, okay. So we have, um, you've, your group's spoken, okay. Hello, who would like to speak? <laughs> I'm, I'm not dangerous. <laughs> ideas are dangerous, not me. Give us your dangerous ideas, Julie. Um, well, we, we said very many things, but one of the things that we noted was it's really important to know who, who is in the space or who's influencing the decisions that are occurring in the livestock sector. <laughs> this was particularly from one of, I think, Mario's presentation on, you know, have we really had an impact? And it's like, when you're looking at who you're mapping in terms of who the decision makers are and making sure they are in the space um, and they understand what is going on. For example, like a meeting at this one where you don't even have people in finance or people in planning and yet, the knowledge of what is going on here would really help them in making decisions when it comes to allocating resources. Because if they don't allocate adequate resources, then the impact that we are looking for would be very difficult to get, and we'll have to continue to depend on donors. And this dependency on donors really has to change in a lot of the developing countries. Because if we can't tilt the balance from dependency, then we're not going to get the scale that we are looking for. And we will just continue piloting and keep on piloting and get a new idea for piloting. But, but also the, the issue also came up around greenhouse gas emissions, which I think the others have, have mentioned. And I hope I've covered. On team's work, a 10% reduction over 10 years time, just projecting this, I mean, may not be really uh, make a big impact. Uh, why, do you, why do you like to project uh, a 10% reduction over 10 years? And you say this is a huge impact. That's a nugget. Thank you. Okay, I think there's two groups we haven't heard from. Is that right? There's a group here, and there's a group here. And then we've covered everyone. Is that right? Speak now or forever hold your peace. All right, so will you be the spokesperson? Um, yeah, I'll speak for our group. We, we actually took the time to talk about Arsenal um, and uh, to see how I'll they were playing. <laughs> um, no, we, we, um, we talked about a number of different things. Um, as you uh, are surprised with uh, the composition of our group, um, you can see that uh, there, there was a lot of wisdom um, in our group. Uh, and uh, as we were chatting ab about it, a, a, lot of our, a lot of our discussion was, was around um, barriers, to, barriers to transformation and barriers to uptake of technology uh, per, and what was going to be a transformational change. Um, so we, we talked a bit about that. We, we knew we were meant to talk about greenhouse gases, but we found this other topic quite interesting um, and spoke a little bit about feeling that uh, a private sector driven um, was was a was a was a was a was a reasonably good way forward. But how to do that, and what were some of the barriers? Um, and then also understanding that un under greenhouse gases, the big issue with as soon as you start getting government involved is that the pace the pace of change slows down and it becomes very very slow. Um, so it was felt how we didn't come to a conclusion, but it was felt what what needed to be done to be able to get private sector more involved and send those signals through to private sector to be able to address some of these issues around greenhouse gases, knowing that government is always going to be very slow and rather, um, uh, rather, how can I put this uh, politely, uh, sedentary. There we go. Good. Thank you very much. Now, the last group. Okay, final group. I think we are going to hear. Okay. <coughs> yes, we also discussed about Arsenal. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
Um, in our group, actually, we, we said on, um, we discussed on how to get stakeholders in the same line, actually mentioning the livestock master plan and the Paris agreement that Manuel mentioned in, in the morning, because, I mean, in, in the presentation. So how do we get, you know, resources, stakeholders in the livestock um, sector to work together and then have a kind of reliable uh, uh, information and data? We mentioned one of the examples in Ethiopia. We have almost for the past 10 years, the livestock population is now at 59, I mean the chicken population is 59, 60 million, but there was no any census happened in the past 10 years. It stays the same still. Mm -hmm. And I, I was telling them actually we did, in the past 10 years, we did 52 <coughs> million chickens, only Ethiopian chickens. So how can we say, you know, <laughs> We have 59, 60 million chickens in the country in our census. So it was this, and also we talked about the green gas, also the green emission uh, in the group. I don't know if I missed, you can add some. Good. It would be more alarming if the population was 52 million and you'd done 59 million. <laughs> yeah. Great, okay, I think we can uh, resume our seats. And I'd like to invite Andrew Bisson to come forward, and George Richardson, and Belinda Richardson. Doesn't matter. You want to go first? So, Richards. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Getting confused with my Richards and Richardsons. <laughs> Okay, Belinda, I think we'll ask you to go first as the, s the sponsoring donor. <laughs> no such luck. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, so this was a really interesting discussion to listen to, the pre from the presentations through to sort of what people were picking up on. Um, so climate adaptation hasn't really been in the foundation's vocabulary, but it's becoming an increasing focus across agricultural development. Um, and so as we're looking into, you know, what can we do around adaptation, climate adaptation um, for small scale producers, inevitably when we talk about livestock mitigation also um, comes into the conversation. And so we've done a little bit of thinking around, you know, as we're looking at climate adaptation, what should we or could we do around mitigation as well? So I think when we talk from our livestock portfolio perspective where we sort of landed is, you know, if there are clear co-benefits for adaptation and mitigation, um, then that's something that we could consider. But just given the relative burden of global emissions, if you look across sectors, um, you know, should the burden be on um, the livestock sector in low middle income countries, especially given the benefits that are for livelihoods and nutrition that are coming from those animals. And so when we sort of think about, you know, climate and the future of, of livestock, we're still very much promoting the benefits of livestock. And then, um, you know, as we look at, we heard about a lot of the tools and, and sort of how can we think about projections and what do we optimize for, what sort of parameters do we put around, you know, achieving country goals on economic growth and poverty and productivity. So as we're looking at improvements in livelihoods and nutrition through increasing productivity and different interventions, you know, then we can start to think about, obviously we don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot by just increasing greenhouse gas emissions, um, but would there be, you know, in the future a tipping point to sort of less higher productivity cows. And so as we're thinking about sort of the future of our investments and how we can achieve um, those goals, I would still say sort of the main focus is around um, adaptation and, you know, more focused on the development goals than really sort of how do we um, reduce emissions from cattle. So it's a really, it's a really interesting time to sort of be in the space of exploring the tools and, and some of the mechanisms we can use to make these projections and sort of help us to move our investments forward in, in the most optimal way, let's say. Very good. Thank you. Um, so yes, a fascinating couple of days so far and still halfway through, so a lot more to come. Uh, I fully endorse your comments and I'm very happy not to talk about climate change on a live stream. Um, 
but um, but maybe there's a few more comments about that. But I guess my, my comments really are more addressing this idea of future proof in the livestock sector. And I think one of the one of the challenges that we have is that the, the livestock sector is not um, it's not an isolated thing. It's it's highly integrated with the crop sector and then highly integrated with cultures, socioeconomies and, and wider systems. And I'm, I'm sort of minded of that. I don't know if you know this picture of five blindfolded people examining an elephant and each one of them has a different piece of the elephant and is trying to say what they're touching. And I think there's a risk if we just look at the livestock sector, it, the trunk will feel like a tree and the legs or the tail are different pieces of it. And you, if you don't have the whole picture, it's hard, you, you can come up with a wrong analysis. And I think in these complex systems, these interactions are pretty critical to getting, getting the analysis right. So I think that the linkages, we haven't talked a lot about the linkages with crop production, but since most livestock's in the crop livestock production system, I think we, we might want to think a bit more about those integrations. Um, I think we use the livestock sector as a sort of a term of convenience. It's not really a single sector. It's, it's, it's lots and lots of different sectors. And there's a tremendous heterogeneity between species, production system, country, where they are in their agricultural <coughs> transformation. So it's a necessary term. We, we need it. But it, it masks some of the complexities and some of the, you know, we were talking in our group about productivity. And we sort of bemoan the fact that productivity hasn't, isn't moving forward as we'd like. And, and that's true. But that's an averaged figure. In certain spots, productivity has gone off the scale. Uh, Mario, you mentioned in China and the pig sector. So we, are we missing that? Like, why? What are the drivers that's happened in China? Can we learn from that? Can we do some positive deviance that there are some bright spots in what's otherwise a bit of a disappointing result? And can we go back to those and see what's worked there? What are the conditions that create that productivity change? So I think trying to be mindful of that heterogeneity um, and then for, for our agency in particular, when it comes to heterogeneity, is I fear there's a group of countries that are dropping off the pack, the, the sort of a, the very lowest countries, the conflict prones, the really challenged ones, these fragile states. And we, we haven't really brought up the topic of the livestock conflict dynamic, which is critical in many of these livestock systems across sub-Saharan Africa and beyond the Middle East where these conflict dynamics are directly impacting um, in the livestock sector and the lives of livestock keepers. So I think I'm sort of interested in, in that kind of a, uh, we also maybe need to broaden our thinking a little bit. Certainly for our agency, I, I forget what it is, but it's the majority of our funding is going into conflict prone or, or conflict affected countries. Um, Tim, you mentioned uh, a number of different outcomes, these domains that, um, that, that Gasol is, is focusing on. And I think that's also important. We've, we've heard a lot about productivity, quite a bit about the environment. And the environment conversation has been around greenhouse gases, but there's land use change and a number of other biodiversity challenges. These things all are important and all sort of interact with each other. So there is a, a bit of a danger of focusing on greenhouse gas emissions, but I think there's more to environment than the gases. Um, but also in terms of people's livelihoods, the things like resilience, the inclusion of marginalized people, people groups like pastoralists and other indigenous peoples. At, at USAID, we talk a lot more about employment these days and the role that agriculture can play in meaningful employment. And you know, the livestock sector has these opportunities, particularly in the downstream production areas. So how does that help feed, feed into a wider economic development paradigm? And we're starting to measure now, not just ag GDP, but the, the sort of downstream flow on effects and con considering that a, g a benefit generated by, by the livestock sector. Um, I think our, our sort of working approach is incremental change, little small steps and gradually the curve will gradually work, work into a positive direction. I think this is how we treat productivity. I'm not convinced that that is necessarily the right way. It's not the only, it, it's, 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 wor it's a worthwhile thing, but I don't think it's, it's going to solve all the problems. So I think, do we need to look a little bit more at these transformative shifts? We, we mentioned the, the Chinese sector, like a complete change in the way production systems come, driven mostly by market forces. But can they, these structural changes, are there policy levers that we could apply? You know, I think of things like a sugar tax and how 
that might that might affect a, a major industry. What about an environment tax that was applied to livestock sector? What what impacts could that have? Um, I think another thing that we has been touched upon, but is is maybe underplayed is that a lot of our talk is about livestock but in the end it's actually people who are making the decisions and it's the interactions of people that shape these things so that whole behavior change i was very struck by this this concept of 70 percent of the consumers are going to be living in urban areas and there's going to be quite a marked difference between urban and rural people so that's a powerful block it's by far the biggest constituent on earth to what extent are they going to start to shape decision making and we, we spoke over lunch yesterday about alternative proteins. Um, the alternative proteins knocked the, the biggest global dairy producer out of business uh, in a relatively short space of time. It now captures 10% of the US market. Um, these alternative proteins are, are, are not a sort of conceptual idea that may or may not scale. It's already scaling and scaling pretty quickly. So I think, I think some of those disruptive, and the technologies in some cases, but it may be behaviors in other cases, it's not necessarily just technologies. Um, I think digital has a huge op role to play. Um, and then I think what we haven't really talked about is a lot of the unknown unknowns, <coughs> the, the transformative factors that we, don't, we haven't really conceptualized, but they, they will come along the line, and what, what role might they play in terms of really affecting some of the models that we have. Um, so, I think, finally, there's been quite a few comments about the models and how can we make the models better. I wonder if we might want to talk a bit more about how do we deal with uncertainty better rather than trying to be more certain. Um, and I, I don't have any simple answers on that. Um, but I think these are systems, they, they are evolve around the interactions of different stakeholders. Are we empowering the different stakeholders to absorb information and data to process it effectively to close those feedback loops so that you don't get these sharp shocks and jerks to the system? Are we, are we building the capacities of the stakeholders in the systems? And what about the governance of some of these food systems? What role does that play in trying to achieve the futures that we want for these livestock systems? And I don't think we haven't really unpacked some of the power dynamics that maybe exist in the systems and the way they're changing. <coughs> and there's things like supermarkets, the rise of consumer pressure, the role of government, the role of private sector, they're all in, in flux and they all have important roles to play in how to shape the future. Um, thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, and finally, George Richards from the Abdul Jamil Community Foundation. George? Oh, yes. yeah. Uh, yeah, from Community Jamil, as is more simply called. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. This is my first time here and very much my first foray into the world of livestock. Um, and I've really enjoyed it. Uh, sadly, have to fly off um, after this, but it's been a um, fascinating meeting and what a great community of practice you have here. Um, for those of you who don't know Community Jamil, we're a family philanthropy originally from the Middle East, from Saudi Arabia originally, um, now operating globally in a bunch of different areas from education and health to livelihoods, the arts. Um, in the health space, we, at the end of last year, launched something at Imperial College London called the uh, Jamil Institute for Disease and Emergency Analytics, which uses computer modeling um, primarily for human health. Uh, human diseases, both epidemic and chronic. They're quite busy at the minute with the China situation. Um, but looking to move into the livestock, we are looking to move into the livestock space. So this has been very much for me a sort of learning process and I've, I've learned a tremendous amount. Just one observation I think from the donor perspective is that um, I've heard in many of the presentations and discussions and working groups, including the one I was in yesterday, uh, about the challenges of translating a lot of the learnings from research, from data, into action in the field, and um, and having the real impact that you know I think we're all trying to achieve. And from a donor perspective, I think that that's incredibly important um, in terms of decision making about allocation of funds. If um, many of these projects, if if they're able to be backed up with a rigorous 
evidence of effectiveness, actual effectiveness in, in, in the field, then that's obviously a far more compelling story than um, simply a proposal based on what data is available and might achieve. So I think that that's, um, that certainly stood out to me with my sort of donor hat on as um, an area for, for the community to, to continue to address. And I know that everybody's very aware of it and um, I think it could only help to strengthen the activities that you're all doing. So with that, thank you very much again for having me and hope to see you all again soon. Great, thanks George and thanks to Belinda and, and Andrew as well. Thank you very much. Let's give them a, a round of applause.